Well, good, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the uh, BIM Summit 2021. Um, hope you all had a good break. My name is Ronan Collins. I'm the digital directory digital director for the Red Sea uh, Development Project, and I'm sitting here in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. And um, with me today we have Angus O'Keefe from Rona Dudman, David Lamon from C and W O'Brien Architects, and Enda Kirwan from Arabs. So we have a bridge engineer, an architect, and a mechanical an engineer all working in the world of information management. And it is my great pleasure to hand over the mic to Angus O'Keefe. And before I do so, just a reminder, if you have any questions during the presentations, please put them on the chat and we will pick them up when we do the Q&A in about half an hour's time. So you're all very welcome. And without further ado, Angus, over to you. Morning all, thank you very much, Ronan. And um, hello to everyone who's joined from around the world. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so I'll be speaking uh, for the next 10 minutes about multidisciplinary BIM in civil engineering design. Um, let me just is that. I'm going to go through uh, some of what I see as the problem for BIM in civil engineering, uh, some recent survey results from an international survey, some solutions that we adopt on projects, um, international developments and uh, some sort of recommendations or, or a vision for how things can be. Uh, the problem as I see it um, is that there is quite a low level of interoperability relative to BIM for, for buildings. Um, you know, uh, so we we see this through through vendor software suites. If you're doing a, a buildings BIM project, you might maybe be able to use some of the Revit suite with good interoperability between various disciplines, um, but it's not quite so straightforward in civil, in, civil infrastructure. Um, the idealization for analysis is it causes problems because you can't just go say from from slab models and um, and, and beam and, and plate models uh, for, for for the BIM 3D models through into structural analysis. We idealize bridges in a different way and uh, interoperability is, is challenging for that. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of the BIM standards aren't necessarily mature in practice. Um, so uh, the um, IFC infrastructure extensions have come out over the last couple of years, and we are um, we haven't yet seen those come through into a lot of the, the software applications. Um, uh, certainly not the ones that are commonly used in Europe. Also, uh, part of the problem is the significant interface between civil infrastructure and the existing condition. Um, so along linear infrastructure projects, we've got interfaces with uh, extensive geotechnics and existing utilities. Um, it's very difficult to model that. Um, and then on uh, larger network, larger um, infrastructure projects, obviously, typically are uh, integrating with pre-existing uh, networks of assets. So whether that be a, a rail infrastructure um, network or roads or, or whatever it may be. And uh, often for asset information management in infrastructure, uh, GIS is adopted rather than, than BIM. So exchanging information between uh, two uh, domains like that is challenging. And unfortunately, often we see uh, clients employ BIM consultants to write EIRs for them. Um, and uh, unfortunately, sometimes those are coming from the buildings domain. And uh, you know, just <laughs> please, Please don't uh, try and prescribe Kobe to uh, civil engineering uh, domain. It just is not uh, practical and certainly won't be until IFC uh, infrastructure extensions become more um, become more mature. On uh, recent survey results, we uh, as part of SEN TC442, which is the European uh, BIM uh, Standardization Committee at SEN, uh, working group six, it, the BIM for Infrastructure Working Group, and we conducted a survey early this year of um, infrastructure project managers and information managers and clients uh, who have had adopted BIM on their projects. And some interesting results from that uh, survey were that ISO 19650 is being required on over half those projects and I assume that is, is continuously increasing. And 
the um, and interestingly, over 60% of the projects have uh, had an established asset information requirement made available to uh, the parties tendering for the project. So it was publicly available in advance. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the clients were seeing that they weren't getting good quality data handed over either from design or uh, towards the end of a project. And that's often associated with the fact that uh, payment wasn't related to the handover of that data. Payment was re related to delivery of design output, delivery of, of construction output, and not necessarily the associated data. Really important parts of ISO 19650 are assessing the capability of the supply chain and uh, setting out a plan and, and, and testing that mobilization plan at the outset. We saw only a third of respondents saying that they had a mobilization plan in place. What I, set, what I show there is in, that um, the, there were perceived benefits from BRIM uh, ranging from 70 to 77%. So we asked, are, uh, are you, do you perceive benefit for your organization, for the overall project, for the client? And really positive results in, in that respect. Um, and, and, and something that we've seen a lot in research projects over the last few years is that the handover into asset, asset information management didn't work very, doesn't work very well. And again, and that's reflected in the survey results at only 32% responding yes uh, or, or uh, agreeing to the statement that that handover worked well. And how is that then relevant to, to design? Well, if this is this is really just testing the application of ISO 19650 standard and open BIM standards to civil engineering infrastructure design. And um, it's very important that people feel trust in those in that standard and are able to implement that on their projects. So I'm going to give some, some examples of, of what we do in, in ROD working with our projects. Um, so I'm a civil engineering consultant. I work on major infrastructure projects in the UK and Ireland predominantly, um, acting as a project manager and, and, and lead consultant. Very important, mentioned a number of times today by other presenters, is getting at the start a very clear picture of the BIM goals. And if take the client's BIM requirements, put them on the table, but then really challenge them with the client at the outset, or even better, challenge them um, at, uh, at tender stage through, through tender queries. We employ a systematic use of agreed common data environment workflows. Again, a number of people have presented on that today. And you know we see lots of use of, of various common data environments, um, some with with um, standardised and structured workflows, others where it's more down to to human application. Um, but it's very important that people agree the rules and follow them. On uh, infrastructure projects, we exchanged information. This this uh, image on the right hand side here is from from a project in the UK. And that involves uh, that's a federated model with information coming through from from step physical files, Revit drawings, uh, 2D and 3D drawings, um, and then in, in in association with that, we're exchanging XML files with the contractor for setting out of the highway, um, and GIS files, and and of course then PDFs and and, and Excel files and, and the likes are being exchanged. We, we adopt uh, across our organisation, the UK National Annex to ISO 19650 Part 2. We haven't yet moved to the Irish National Annex. Um, I'm not convinced we will until we see that that is being adopted um, uh, across the country. Um, what we also do, do a lot of is, is parametric modelling, but it's typically within applications, not so much between applications. So on the top right, you see uh, a, a GIS model of a road alignment, which we used uh, for which we used parametric modeling for defining the requirements for road restraint systems and modeling the locations of hazards. And we use a lot of scripting tools in conjunction with BIM and GIS software. You see a, a, a gantry there for which we have six or seven parameters that we can use with, with parametric modeling and scripting. To, to model gantries in uh, BIM software. Drainage model and the third image down, again with parametric linkages between the, uh, 
the finished ground surface and the, the drainage profiles and then bringing that through into federated models. Um, and in the bottom image, then a bridge model, which is parametrically linked to the highway alignment. Um, again, not great. Uh, not a great amount of parametric modeling between applications, often within applications. Built into a lot of that is are, are some semantics, um, some uh, data um, or sort of level of information that you might mention. Um, hey, um, Thank you very much. Um, and classification by layers. It's a 1980s technology that a number of clients still look for. Uh, we see it in Scandinavia and we see it in the UK and Ireland as well. Uh, very important is how to model um, existing utilities. And what we find is it's really important to, to tag the uh, 3D models of existing utilities with properties that define the quality of the information. So from where did you get the information? Was it a desktop study? Was it verification? And we've created a, a small ontology for uh, PAS 128 survey types for that, which enables us to do uh, clash detection with varying tolerances based, based on the quality of the information. So there's just some international developments that we're seeing. There are significant industry initiatives across processes, exchanges, uh, information exchange and data format standards. We see IFC now, as I mentioned earlier, with the infrastructure extensions, BIM collaboration format. We see more and more use of that. We see that industry is demanding that vendors open up their databases. And one example of that is the, the progress with the open CDE uh, API for common data environments. And uh, I think it's really important that we as industry demand that, that, that vendors do that. Um, and, and open up their applications to us so that we can uh, adopt more modularity. It was mentioned right at the outset by Alain Waha, um, was the, the greater use of the internet. And we've been working for the last few years in the area of linked data and semantic web, and we're now implementing some of those technologies with public asset owners um, for defining machine readable rules, which enables us to then validate that information handed over is um, a compliant with those rules because until we have something like that it's nigh on impossible for us as an industry to really populate all of the databases correctly um, and satisfy ourselves that they're done correctly um, we see internationally that the most effective purchasing of information and procurement of information by clients is when they publish their asset information requirements well in advance um, of, of major projects um, unfortunately, we're not in that case in, in Ireland, but we see it very effectively in the Netherlands and, and other countries and the UK to some extent. And of course, it's co coordination uh, with geospatial data. So just to wrap up then, my Angus, recommendations. Can I, can I wrap it up really quick here, Angus, please? Yep. Yeah. We're going to gradually um, evolve to, to a data-driven and, and, and uh, hybrid situation where we liberate data from applications. I recommend that people adopt uh, modular common data environments. Don't just go for one massive system, uh, enterprise-wide system. You need modularity. Uh, make sure that you price for providing value to clients because it's pr it does cost time and money to, to provide data in, in a compliant format. Um, expect better informed clients and challenge your clients and partners to be better informed. Uh, reuse rules. Um, so we need. We don't just need the PDF standards. We need the standards standardization through use. So reuse ontologies, reuse rules, and um, get better comfort with with it, using those rules through bottom up case based development. And demand top down leadership, not just from leaders in your organisations, but from a national level. Um, and and and. Uh, it's really important that we as an industry uh, demand that that sort of leadership. And that is me, Ronan. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Angus. Uh, some some very interesting insights there in regards to uh, civil engineering and the challenges that guys like me in buildings don't always comprehend in terms of what's going on in, in terms of that space. So uh, lots of food for thought there. Thanks very much. So moving swiftly on, we have David, who's going to give us uh, an architect's perspective on information management. Uh, and David's promised me he's going to keep this 10 minutes. So the clock starts now, David. Off you go. Perfect. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it's great. Great, thanks for the intro, Ronan. 
Um, from an architectural point of view, I'm hoping to discuss examples of how our practice is using the data science pipeline of capturing, cleaning, visualizing, modeling and interpreting data to help create value in a form both practice and project decision making. Uh, fingers crossed, eight, ten minutes, we'll see, we'll see after we get through it anyway. Um, it wouldn't be a BIM event without a good acronym. Uh, I'm not usually a fan of them, but uh, this one is awesome or OSEMN. It's a, it's a similar one from Hilary Mason and Chris Wiggins that we use throughout our data science pipeline. Understanding the typical workflow and how the data science pipeline works is a crucial step towards business understanding and problem solving. So we're going to start off by taking a look at obtaining our data, scrubbing or cleaning our data, exploring and visualizing our data, modeling it, uh, and then finally, we're going to take a look at interpreting our data. Now, I know interpreting doesn't start with an N, but uh, it's not my acronym, but we'll, we'll take a look. Uh, if we have time towards the end, what I hope to do as well is take a look at what we have in development uh, and then kind of wrap up with some conclusions and lessons learned because uh, it wasn't clean sailing all the way through, uh, being honest. So obtaining our data. We cannot do anything in data science without having any data. As a rule of thumb, there are some things we must take into consideration when obtaining our data. Uh, we must identify all of our available data, data sets, which can be from the internet or external internal databases. And we must be able to extract the data into a usable format, such as CSV, JSON, XML, etc. So how do we as a practice at CDO obtain our data? The first thing we wanted to do was identify what we want to record, the information that was important to us. So quite obviously that would be projects, projects and inquiries. The organizations associated with those projects, so clients and other consultants we work with, the contacts that belong to those organizations, the documents we produce and receive, and the metadata that's associated with each of them and how they develop, uh, accounting information about project and practice uh, accounting, correspondence, uh, incoming information, information from site, uh, in the data that we produce, CDE data that's stored uh, in the cloud, and then lastly, action generated data. So what I mean by action generated data is just by using the system itself, we're producing information. So you want to capture that as well. And um, they're kind of our data capture points. Uh, how that looks as a system for us. Uh, we deployed about two to three years ago, a relational database, which we use SQL to query and manage. So this is where we store uh, information in relation to our projects, organizations, contacts, documents, etc. Uh, we partnered with a company called Dell Tech PIM, USB Union Square. They're quite common in the construction industry, but we like the approach they had where they can install and set up on our own servers in-house. So a lot of benefits of that. We're not kind of reliant on the cloud internet connection. Um, but Dell Tech PIM also allowed us to control the data entry. So we were kind of putting it in the correct format, which is good for us. It also has some kind of add-ons like accounting, document manage, and a mobile app. Uh, more recently, we partnered with another company called Flow10, uh, who install on top of our Delta PIM system, and that allows us to make the most of the data we have in our database a bit more efficiently, some added features, which I hope to take a look at towards the end. Uh, then we have linked data sources. So we use Xero for accounting, so we can link the information between the two. Uh, we're building information models. A really good tip or an add-in we use with Revit is Tracer. So it's produced by Nathan Miller of Proving Ground. We can kind of push out our Revit models to ODBC format and link with Microsoft Power BI quite quickly. Uh, similarly with CDEs, we use Autodesk Construction Cloud. So Philip Mueller in Autodesk, he produced some really good workflows and templates for getting information from the likes of Docs and linking with Power BI. And then finally, on top of all that, we have our intranet pages. So these internet pages come from Dell Tech, Flow 10. We also create our own. Uh, and we embed Microsoft Power BI charts and information through iframes in this as well. So uh, cleaning our data or scrubbing it. This phase of the pipeline usually requires the most time and effort because the results and output of a machine learning model is only as good as what we put into it. Basically garbage in, garbage out type thing here. Our objective is to examine the data, understand every feature or variable we're working with, identify errors, missing values, corrupt records, clean the data and replace or fill missing values. Somewhere where you come across this quite often is with, with models. We use Revit, so I'm just going to say Revit models, but this could be empty parameter fields or information that you have to go back and re-input. 
And next up, we look at exploring and visualizing our data. So now during the exploration phase, we try to understand what patterns and values our data has. We use different types of visualizations and statistical testing to back up our findings. So this is where we'll be able to derive hidden meanings behind our data through various graphs and analysis. Uh, our objective here is to find patterns in the data uh, through visualization and charts and to extract features by using statistics to identify and test significant variables. So an example of this quite, quite basically would be if we've got a database of a lot of project information and accounting information, we can query this uh, and quite quickly pull out, for example, percentage of fee remaining on a project. So yeah, we're capturing data here, inputting to our database uh, and charting it as well. So if we dig a little bit deeper into our project, uh, the screenshot here is of one of our projects where we inputted fees against each work stage and service. Capturing timesheet data on an ongoing basis, we've deducted hourly rates and associated costs. By inputting expected resourcing data, we can forecast project profitability uh, until completion. And the dashboard is live, interactive, and can be filtered by project team as opposed to individual projects. So if we do it by project team, we get a we get a better understanding of how different teams are performing, or it could be sectors, how the residential sector for us or hotel leisures are performing. Um, modeling our data. So models are generally rules in, in a statistical sense. Think of a machine learning model as tools in your toolbox. You will have access to many algorithms and use them to accomplish different business goals. The better features you use, the better your predictor power will be. After cleaning your data and finding what features are most important, using your model's predictive tool will only enhance the business decision making. Our object objective here is to perform in-depth analytics by creating predictive models. Machine learning algorithms may be better at predicting, detecting and processing patterns uh, than us mere humans, but they can't reason and that's where we come in. Uh, so here's an example and another screenshot from, from the system, uh, example of one of our models. With the use of mobile integration on an app, we can capture and track live data from site. Over time and as the model develops, we can begin to predict trends on a construction project, such as the performance of a consultant or subcontractor, frequent issues uh, or areas of building that might require further inspection. Uh, another data set we commonly use are Navisworks Clash reports. So what we can do here is gather the Clash reports by discipline on a monthly basis um, and over a long period of time and multiple projects. What we can do is start to model this data uh, in a predict predictive trend. So stages in a project where a certain discipline might have more issues, we can preempt them start to address them earlier in the design process uh, or maybe resource them a bit more effectively. You got one minute left, David. Grant. So um, in, when it comes to interpreting our data, so this has been the last step in the pipeline the most important, and the most important step. The pipeline is to understand and learn how to explain our findings through communication. Uh, the telling story is key, so don't underestimate it. What we have in production or in development, while we're working with Flow 10 here, uh, they've got some great features, but they can dig into our database uh, and our ISO 9001 quality management system. So we have a series of tasks and procedures. We can associate them with contacts in our database, capture the time they recorded, their status, any associated documents uh, in the database as well, and kind of give an overall project health check and ensure quality. We can also pull out information on our projects and map them, uh, upload GeoJSON files for like planning zoning areas, and kind of filter our projects by sector. Uh, I won't take up too much more time, just kind of conclude with a bit of lessons learned. Uh, it was a huge learning curve for us, uh, but a bit of some lessons learned and recommendations. Uh, first, always try to identify what the problem is you're trying to solve with data. Start collecting data now. It can take time to build up data sets of appropriate size. Uh, for example, statistics usually works well with a sample size of about a thousand. Uh, garbage in, garbage out. I've, I've said it again, uh, I said it before. If you can manage the input of data, so this results in less cleaning required later. Staff buy-in was and still is the biggest hurdle for us. Getting users to engage and input data can be difficult, so it's something to consider. Uh, and the last kind of learning point would be as architects uh, or designers, engineers, data science is not something we're generally trained in. So trial, try, fail, ask for feedback and learn. So if anyone has feedback for me, please uh, just message me delighted to discuss. 
So data generally, it's not about statistics, machine learning, visualization. Data is about understanding, understanding the problem and how you can solve it using data with whatever tools or techniques you choose. Uh, understand your problem, understand your data, and the rest will follow. Uh, so that is me. Thanks for the heads up, Ron. Thanks, David. Well done. And uh, in keeping with the tradition of the industry, we're, we're leaving the, the least amount of time for the last important discipline, which is MEP. So a, a situation that Enda Kerwin is very familiar with. Um, we're sandwiching him <laughs> in at the very end. He's now got eight to ten minutes for his presentation. And uh, um, the last okay. time I saw you, last time I saw you, had a blue beard. Um, I'm not sure what it's happened gone. to it. It's gone. It's yeah, gone. Yeah, I looked very different yesterday. So look, I have I have this. I'll have it wrapped up in ten minutes. Okay. Hopefully, everybody Go can see it. my screen there. I have a couple of visualizations yep. in there, so hopefully they work. Okay, so hi all. Uh, my name is Enda Kerwin, and I am the uh, the MEP BIM lead for Arup in Ireland. I've over twenty years' experience delivering MEP, uh, sorry, multidisciplinary projects, and I'm a BIM Level Two certified project information manager and task information manager. Over the years, I've developed a passion for data-driven solutions, striving to facilitate those around me to maximise the benefits of using BIM. Uh, to produce world-class data-rich models um, that meet their clients' requirements and exceed their expectations. For the next 10 short minutes, I'll be speaking about how Arup MEP have embraced information management uh, to ensure we align with entire project teams and how Arup are helping to create an industry benchmark in defining a standardized scope of service when delivering MEP projects in the BIM environment at design stage. I will also speak a little bit about why it is important to follow international and industry standards for achieving BIM efficiencies and enabling automation. So as the digital construction as digital construction evolves, our models are becoming richer with more data than ever before. Gone are the days of producing MEP drawings, schedules, data sheets, and so on as separate entities. Federated BIM models enable us to produce our MEP deliverables in a more efficient and automated digital, digital way. This is the new E3 science building model located in Trinity College, Dublin. Our immersive technology team are creating these models using software from the gaming industry to provide the ultimate user experience. In this model, you will see a small example of some of the potential design information that can be stored parametrically within the elements and systems. This can include anything from families and type names, references, dimensions, system information, classifications, pipework and ductwork flow rates and pressures, and plant and equipment electrical loads. So the question is, how can we ensure that this potential gold mine contains information that is usable, useful, searchable, and properly structured for future uses? Machine readable structured data is one key component which is necessary for pro project efficiency and automation. Arab projects have really benefited from implementing international standards, most importantly ISO 19650, which we use for organizing and digitizing information about buildings using BIM. The evolution of BIM and digital construction has highlighted the importance of using these international standards rather than individual company specific standards like we commonly saw before. This ensures consistency on things like naming conventions, file naming conventions, drawing and document numbering, and deliverable status codes and revisions. Arup have established our global Revit standard, which, comp which comprises of our Revit templates, our Revit family libraries, and guidance for structuring parameter values to align with these international standards. The image on the right shows how Arup Revit families are set up following the BS8541 identification and classification code of practice to ensure element name and consistency across projects. We also include UniClass 2015 classification to provide to provide machine readable structured identification information for all of our model elements. One key aspect that we focus on within MEP is using the same shared parameters um, between disciplines to ensure design information can be clearly communicated and reused between teams. For example, mechanical engineers populating their, their, the electrical loads in their plant and equipment. This then allows electrical engineers to use these same values to size their cables, their switch gear, and so on. It's really important to clearly communicate the information needed from the model elements for, uh, for each discipline, to agree on the shared parameters which, which it will be used, and also the format of this information. 
After seeing multiple different BIM perspectives across the industry with the standard approach varying from company to company and from project to project, we identified that the level of risk could be reduced by agreeing a common information management approach for issues that regularly cause conflict and disagreements. Arup and other multidisciplinary members of the Association of Consulting Engineers of Ireland collaborated on agreeing a common approach to delivering MEP projects in the BIM environment. The culmination of this was the ACEI BIM Advice Note for Building Services Consulting Engineers, which was published in May 2020 and is available on the ACEI uh, website for download. This advice note was written to conform with ISO 19650 and BISRIA BG6 2018. The advice note is intended to be the national industry benchmark to define the standardised scope of service in Ireland. It highlights areas of potential, uh, potential increased efficiency as well as primary areas of risk. Industry agreed standard LOD and LOI or the level of informa information need for project work stages. Uh, some detail on costing and quantity takeoffs, how to incorporate BISRIA BG6 on a project and some guidance on clash detection and coordination in line with BISRIA BG6. BISRIA BG6 is a document, uh, is, a, is a design framework document for building services and the 2018 edition includes details on BIM. It clarifies roles and responsibilities of the design team, clashes and coordination, the design relationship between work stages um, and some model and drawing definitions and examples. So the ACEI agreed approach is to deliver BIM, or sorry, MEP design models to BISRIA BG6 stage 4.1, which is described as feasible generic design. The contractor is responsible for developing their models for construction as described in sections 4.2 and 4.3, covering coordinated working drawings. Um, the evolution of BIM and digital construction has brought so many advantages to the way we work, but the fundamental principles of how we deliver projects remains. MEP consultants are responsible for delivering design intent models and drawings, and MEP contractors are responsible for final coordination and production of the working drawings. And this BISRIA document is a great way to illustrate this responsibility. And for data two, minutes. two minutes, perfect. Yeah, for data harvesting and analysis, we must understand that the information in our projects now needs to be properly structured. As many of you may remember, when we were working in a paper-based des uh, design process, we ended up with mountains of drawing specifications, calculations on paper of on sheets of paper that were filed in folders, drawing racks, archives, which made it near impossible to find information efficiently. But now we are working in the digital environment. The management of the same information can be much more accessible, but only if it is formatted in a structured way. One of the key benefits of having properly structured data in your models and on projects as a whole is the idea that it can be machine readable. When information is, is machine readable, algorithms can be used to automate any number of tasks or processes that we can think of. Tasks which would normally use large resources and add cost to a project can be completed by machines. So some of the MEP examples include ductwork and pipework pressure drop calculations, cable and containment sizing, creation of drawing sheets and registers at the click of a button. We often use RF tools for the manipulation of data within our models. Clarity automation service for running uh, tasks such as Dynamo, Rhino and Grasshopper scripts. And we have in-house automation tools that, that our staff develop um, to share information efficiently and in line with BEPs. Imagine the possibilities if you were able to access and analyse all of your design information from all previous projects saved on your company servers. Um, I won't spend too much time on this one. So basically just some other key considerations. Establishing a clear understanding of what your client's requirements actually are. Ensuring alignment across disciplines um, in your project team, we need to clearly set out and agree our standards, methods and procedures. So in, in our contract docu documents, namely the BEP, the BIM execution plan, the asset information requirements document, a responsibility matrix. Employing a common data environment ensures that the whole project team collaborates using the single source of truth and for all project data. We find it really useful to map out discipline specific workflows for individual tasks or large processes and um, to ensure that we're all aligned um, and any coding and automation um, requirements should be discussed with design teams in advance of model setup. So this is the last slide. Um, as you can see, there are 
there are huge potential gains and efficiencies to be made when fully engaging digital workflows on your projects. But one of the main considerations for achieving these is to manage project information in a structured way from the outset. I really hope that you've all gained some insight into why it is important to follow international and industry agreed standards to allow these benefits, benefits to be realized. And as we come to the close, I'll refer to one of my favorite phrases, and that's the best time to structure your data was 10 years ago. The second best time is now. I'd like to thank the BIM coordinators so much for allowing me to speak today and to all of you for listening in. Thanks, Ronan. I'm pretty sure that was about 10 minutes, so bang on time. Thanks. Yeah, nearly bang on. Well done, Andrew. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> um, and, 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 uh, and we're not going to uh, chat too much. We've got about 10 minutes left to do some Q&A, um, and we've had some good questions coming in from, from the audience. So I'm going to go back to Angus to kick it off. Um, Angus, one of, the, one of the delegates has asked a question about the IFC format um, and your comments that it appears to be failing in terms of interoperable standards for infrastructure projects. Is there, is there now a requirement for a, a redress of IFC or is there a new approach or a new format required? What are your thoughts about how we address that issue? I, I don't necessarily think it's the case that it's been failing. It's just it hasn't until now really been addressed. And I have uh, BSI, Building Smart International, have done a huge amount of work in the last few years to uh, bring in the uh, infrastructure extensions. Um, you know, it's going to take some time before software vendors uh, bring that into their applications. Um, we see that in some cases already, particularly in, in Scandinavia. Um, but uh, I think in reality, IFC is still going to struggle to um, be uh, applicable across the full um, life, life, life um, span of, of, of construction projects until we move to IFC 5, which is a much, which is planned to be a much more modular data model um, and might be more easily implemented in applications. Um, but we're a bit away from that yet. All right, very good. Thank you, Angus. Um, David, there was a question for you in regards to your uh, presentation on data analytics, and it starts out saying that without good data, all analytics are useless, which is very true. Um, how, how do you and your business make sure the data you're getting is accurate to start off with? How, what, what process do you have for actually checking that the input data is accurate? Is accurate? Yeah, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Very good question, actually. Um, just before, before I answer, I'm not sure if you've seen the Autodesk report recently. The, I think it was titled Harvesting the, Harvesting the Data Advantage of Construction, but it's a very good report. There's a webinar as well to go with it. But that talks about uh, one third of all poor decisions in the construction industry is a result of poor data. Um, and it costs the construction industry about 1.8 trillion a year. Um, so it's a huge, it's a huge, it's a huge thing to get right. For, for us personally, that's one of the reasons why we uh, teamed up with Deltec PIM. It controls our input. So again, kind of the phrase garbage in, garbage out. If we control the input going in, it means we don't have to worry too much about what comes out of it because it's structured in the correct way. Uh, our system also allows us to run checks of validation. So it's a, it's important to kind of build in that QA check as well. And uh, I know Enda talked a bit about Dynamo and visual programming. So you can you can automate your, your QA checks uh, or model checks with, with likes of visual programming. Or if it's something like Kobe, you know, the MBS BIM toolkit is a good way of kind of checking data sets that way as well. Great, thanks. Thanks, David. So, so Enda, there's a, there's a question that came in. It wasn't specifically addressed to you, but I think you're in, in a good position to answer it. Um, I'll try my best. So that, yeah, give it a go. Um, <laughs> so the, the question is, at the, in the current moment, how aware are manufacturers about the need to produce valuable models? Um, is the industry in general communicating to achieve lower LOD elements, but with a more trustworthy data embedded? Um, and to kind of take on from what you were talking in your presentation about the, the industry agreements that you've been party to and are involved with, are the mechanical contractors and their supply chain also bought into that process or, or, or is it still much being being led by the engineering side of the, of the industry? Where, where does it, where do the manufacturers fit in? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think overall the the whole process overall is getting better, Ronan. I mean, you know, it's it's taken a, 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 there's a, there's been a huge transition period for people to adapt to this new process, or you know, I wouldn't say a new process, but the process of actually you know structuring out your project or structuring out all of the BIM contractual documents and all of that. Manufacturers uh, definitely, I think, from my side of things anyway, we within MEP we would normally never really use kind of manufacturers families 
technologies or things like that. And um, with regards to too many, uh, you know, the, the models might be too big or, you know, for what we're actually delivering a, a generic, uh, feasible generic design, we don't need to use that. So Arup would use their own sort of generic families for that. Um, but in, in certain cases we have, there are data centers where we have used manufacturers, families and, and it's getting better, you know, as, as David referred to there, there, there are certain uh, parameters that are left unpopulated and, and you know, that's, that's kind of, it, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of pointless putting parameters or fields for information into, into a family or into an element and leaving it unpopulated. You know, it's, they're there for a reason. You know, we can, we can try and get as much information into, into our elements and into our families and across the board. And that, that's, I'm talking about, you know, from, from right from concept stage right to the very end. But, but what really needs to happen is just structuring that process. So structuring that information and, and, and perhaps agreeing that throughout the, the life cycle of that project. So agreeing that throughout the, the BIM execution plans. So whether it's design stage carrying on in, into construction stage, but that information is crucial. So, you know, if there's an FM team coming on at the end, they, 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 they potentially need certain information. And if it's not, if it's not communicated throughout the life cycle of that project, then, you know, that's parameters will be left unpopulated. But I, I, it's getting better, Ronan. It is definitely okay. getting better. I, you know, depending on the size of projects you're working on as well, you know, it's it's the process itself is is starting to. You can see it. You can see the momentum is building. You know, Great. so it's it's. I'm positive for it. Yeah. I'm I'm going to cut you off, and because Thanks. there's a whole bunch of questions coming flying in here. I, I knew this was going to be a challenge. We've got 800 people <laughs> listening to the call, and the questions are yeah. pouring in as, as we speak. Um, so going going back to you, um, you Angus, because I think you're you're in a good position to answer this. Um, modeling of temporary works. I, I know it's a massive challenge in civil engineering projects. Um, how, how important is it to model temporary works and, and are they something that you include in your process or do you rely on the contractors? Can you, can you speak about temporary works though? Um, yeah, I, I can't just answer it with a yes or no because I've seen different, it's different grades of temporary works. Like if someone's doing a, a two meter a trench for putting in a drainage run and as a trench box I don't see any point in modeling temporary works for that um what about, certainly what about shoring a better rate of what about shoring for a major for a major bridge structure if you had temporary shoring yeah, a major if, you're, bridge. if you're if you're doing a major coffer dam in a marine situation and you're looking at the interfaces between temporary and permanent works and you're looking at um you know hard and soft clashes you're looking at construction phasing 4d modeling um, then absolutely, um, but it really, it's, it's, I wouldn't just do it for the sake of having some pretty pictures. There needs to be some, some value in it, some purpose in, in modeling um, the temporary works. Um, of course, we would, we would typically model them from an analysis, structural analysis perspective, but that isn't necessarily been. Right. Okay. Great. Um, and I would, I would add to that as well. That you, you need to have the contractor's input because the contractor's methods and the contractor's systems have a major influence on how that actually goes together. Um, so uh, as before we wrap up, just a, a, one last question for um, David, and this is a bit of a crystal ball question, David. H how do you envision data science, digital twins and machine learning influencing our industry going forward? Um, and I'll, I'll, cav I'll caveat that a little bit with one comment I had. You, you're, you mentioned that you were using your data analytics to measure your spend versus your fee or your, your budgets. Um, how do you stop that driving performance where people stop doing work and get drawings out the door to meet? KPIs rather than actually producing good quality information. So how, how do you see data science actually driving the industry? Um, yeah, so the, I suppose to approach the broad question, um, it's 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 personal imagination. It's, it's it's endless, it's limitless. It's it's wherever you want to take it, I suppose you can go with it. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't really answer the question too much, but um, in kind of conjunction with my, my role at Cedar Brian Architects, I also assist and lecture in TU Dublin and supervise some postgraduate research. So some people who know more about the likes of digital twin than me are, are kind of researching this area and, and some of one of them this year actually is taking a look at uh, using digital twins uh, for climate simulation for proposed new developments. We also do a bit of work with a company called View City um, who we use it for planning purposes. I know in Ireland the new housing for all plan that came out recently stated that by the end of next year the planning process in Ireland is going to be digital e-planning. So there's definitely a role digital digital twins play in the kind of planning system here. Um, for your own question, Ronan, how do you stop people hitting QA tasks and get drawings out the door? Um, it's it's a balance, and and sometimes you have to do these tasks retrospectively uh, after the point, which it's never ideal, but needs needs must sometimes. 
Absolutely, and I, we could spend the, whole, the rest of the day talking about that particular issue of itself. So um, to the panel, thank you very much for some excellent presentations. Very, very broad in 45 minutes. Um, and and to uh, thank you for taking all the questions. Um, if if you if you have time, uh, you can probably address some of the additional questions that I didn't get a chance to raise in the actual Q&A session. So to, to all of you, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, I look forward to meeting you guys in, in the coming months or coming year. Brilliant. Thanks, Ronan. Thanks, Ronan. thanks, David, and thanks, thanks Angus, all. as well. Yeah, great Cheers. presentations. Thanks, everybody.